Well, on Good Friday, for those of you who joined us, what a phenomenal uh, number of people showed up and, and, and the spirit was incredible as we gathered together and, and we left that service Friday night really in disbelief. Jesus was dead. Our hearts were broken. Our spirits heavy as we put ourselves into the shoes of those early believers. Our hope literally shattered. The events of the crucifixion left us numb and speechless. To know that our Savior lay lifeless in the tomb was more than we could bear. But then, are you ready, church? But then, and aren't you glad in Scripture we see all kinds of but then moments, and we are having a but then moment. But then came the morning of the third day. In Luke 24, it is recorded like this on the first day of the week, very early in the morning. The women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, praise be to God, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. And I say it again this morning, praise be to God, he is risen. He is alive, hope is reborn, rejoice and be glad for our crucified Savior is alive again. He has conquered sin, death and hell. Satan has been defeated because Jesus lives. We can face all our tomorrows, all our fears are gone. Great and mighty is the Lord our God, his death is our redemption. His resurrection is our hope, our joy, our victory, and our entrance into a brand new life. Church, I say it one more time. He is risen. Glory be to God. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. The reality is that sums up what we've been celebrating this week, the final days of Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection. This changed everything. I love the story, probably not a true story, but I like it anyway, the two Roman soldiers who had the responsibility to stand guard at the tomb. Wouldn't you hate to have that job? Those two Roman soldiers were standing guard next to the tomb. They were, they were supposed to have kept that tomb secure, but they, 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 they failed. <laughs> they could not contain him. And they turned around and Jesus was gone. They're standing there kind of baffled as to what had just happened. And then one guard is said to look at the other and say, man, we are dead meat. We are in serious trouble. What are we going to do? And the other guard looked to his buddy, and, his buddy and said, ah, don't worry about it. A week from now, nobody will ever remember this even happened. <laughs> well, here we are 2,000 years later. That old Roman Empire didn't last long. The Roman Empire as it was is no more but today, 2,000 years later, we celebrate what God did through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is risen. Jesus Christ is alive. Despite what we believe, despite the good news of this Resurrection Sunday, you know, the reality is that people still ask tough questions about this faith, about Jesus. That's what this message today is all about. I've heard questions over the years that go something like this. 
How much sin do I need to commit before I've sinned too much? You ever heard a question like that? How do I know, pastor, if I'm right with God? Does God look at my good works and see if they outweigh my bad ones? Or maybe he checks to see if my bad ones outweigh my good ones. Or does it really even matter what I do? Maybe it's just about what I believe and because I believe no matter what else, I'm all right. How do I know if I'm right with God? That last question is really the the real question behind all of the others. And today I'd like to focus in and ask you to think about this. The big question today on this Easter Sunday, 2022, is simply this. Are you right with God? If something happened to you and this would be your last moment on earth, what do you you think would happen? Are you in a right relationship with God? The reality is this morning that question is the only question that really matters. When all is said and done, it's the only thing. So today we're going to be in part two of our series as we look at those famous last words that Jesus spoke while he was on the cross. And as we look at Jesus' last words, we're going to look at it through the lens of the resurrection for sure. But as we look at Jesus' last words, I want to, I want to allow those moments to unpack some things for us. Before we do that, let me break down into four categories where I think a lot of people find themselves. Now, this is, this is not deeply theological. It's just observational. Most people tend to fall into one of four categories. When you ask them, are you right with God? In one way or another, they'll, they'll kind of answer in one of these four ways. There'll be those who are most likely secure, but they're not real sure. It really, it's a tough place to be. They probably really are right with God, but they just don't have a great peace about it for whatever reason. Sometimes it's ignorant, sometimes it's low self-esteem. Lots of things play into this. I remember I was ministering to a lady several years ago who was in the nursing home and diabetes was just destroying her body. Her kidneys were shutting down. She knew that the end was very, very close. And I remember talking to her about what Jesus had prepared for those who trusted in him. And I remember asking her, I, I, I said, do you... Do you just look forward to seeing the face of Jesus? You look forward to being in heaven. And she said, well, pastor, I I hope so. I I hope I've been good enough. And she was just kind of caught in this miserable middle of, of being secure. I believe she knew Jesus. She testified to his grace, but being unsure. That's one category of people. There's another one. There are those who feel sure, but probably aren't secure. They might have a false sense of security. They believe in religion. Boy, I hope you believe in more than just religion. They believe in religion or their good works. Maybe they believe in the faith of their family members or their church, thinking, oh, the church will get me to heaven. But in all reality, they're not really secure with God, never really personally trusted Christ. This is a third group of people, and those would be people who are probably not sure or secure. They would say, well, I don't know. I kind of sort of think about faith once in a while, but I'm not really sure. I, I haven't made a commitment. The fourth category would be those who are both secure and sure. They, they have this sense that they're into the word, that they have a passionate a life with Christ. They're walking with him. They're, they're a part of this journey with Jesus. And, and they would say, yes, beyond a shadow of any doubt, I'm right with God. I know that I'm right with him. I am confident and I am sure. So how do we achieve that position? Obviously, that's where we need to be. And today I want to ask you three questions that that help us through the lens of what Jesus said on the cross. Three questions that that help us become secure and sure in our relationship with God. Question number one, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Answer this question. First question is this, do you see your need? Do you see your need? 
Do you acknowledge that you have the need of forgiveness, the need of, a, of the forgiveness of a Savior? So let's go to the scriptures this morning. If you've got your Bibles with you, go ahead and this would be a good time to turn to Luke 23. This is where we get into that famous last word or phrase of Jesus we're going to spend our time on today. Luke 23, beginning with verse 32. It says there, two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him, meaning Jesus there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. We talked about that phrase last week. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Verse 35, the people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. But then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Can you imagine a conversation like this happening as these three men hung on those crosses. So here's the scene. Jesus hanging in the middle, two criminals on crosses, two thieves, one on each side. And I would argue in a very real way that those two thieves on each side of Jesus, in a very real way, they represent us. That we are either one of two thieves. The Bible says, the repentant one said to the arrogant one, verse 41, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. We are getting what we deserve. In other words, we're guilty. We deserve this. He saw his need. So let's bring it back to us this morning. What about you? Do you see your need? And the truth is, a lot of people would say, no, I, I really don't. I, I don't really see a need for God in my life. We see this played out in lives of people all around us. They, they see no need. I've not done much wrong. I'm a pretty good person. I try hard. I never killed anybody. That's a really low standard, you know. I'm no Hitler. I think you could say now, Another individual has kind of been raised to that unfortunate reality. I'm no Putin. I'm no Stalin. No Saddam Hussein. I, I'm a good person. I pay my taxes, at least most of them. I think I'm okay with God. You see, a lot of people simply don't see their need. Let, let me help you. Can I help you this morning? I, I want to be helpful. I, I want us to take a moment and, and, and let's, let's understand our need. Let me ask you a, a, a question. How many of you would be honest enough to say that at some point in your life you've told a lie? Well, would you just raise your hand on Easter Sunday morning all over the room? You, you don't lie in church, right? So you raise your hand and say, yep, yep, I've told a lie. Somewhere in your life. Now, those of you who didn't lift your hands, you're now one of us. <laughs> and so, 
if you've told a lie before, can I just ask, in all honesty, serious question, if you've told a lie before, say it out loud, what does that make us? Sinners, liars, room full of liars this morning. Mm. Second question, on this Easter Sunday, I'd ask you, have you ever, you ever stolen something? You ever taken something that's not yours? You know, that could happen just as, as easily as taking the answers to a test that don't belong to you. Have you ever stolen something? Maybe you've walked into a store, you've walked into somebody's house, you've taken something you shouldn't take. All right, here we go, it's time to be honest. How many of you have stolen something? A little more reluctant on this one. All right, let me ask you that question then. If you've stolen something, I just need to, I need to make sure you understand, what does that make us? Thieves? Bunch of thieves, look at you. All right, we gotta keep going. How many of you would say that at some point in your life, you've, you've in some way, some shape, some form, you have put something else ahead of God. You have, you have put something in your life in, in the place of preeminence reserved only for God. How many of you would say that you've done that? Just raise your hands this morning and said, yeah, I've done that, Pastor, yeah. You know what that makes you? Idolater. An idolater. You put anything in the place of God that becomes idolatry. Now, let's just, let's just nail this down in case there's any confusion. I'm standing here this morning in front of a bunch of lying, stealing idolaters. Welcome to church this morning, Easter Sunday, 2022. My goal is to encourage you in your walk with the Lord. And you know what? So am I. Now this is probably gonna upset some of you because you think I'm just perfect. <clears throat> Hardcore truth today, I made you do it. I'm a sinner. How many of you believe your pastor's a sinner? I'll raise, don't, just raise them up, all right? Don't. <laughs> Not proud of it. Oh no. I've lied, cheated, lost my temper, had impure thoughts, said hurtful things about people I should never have said. And that's just the list from this week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was last week. <laughs> what do I deserve? Well, Scripture's pretty clear on it. Because of my sin before God, what do I deserve? The Bible shows me that I deserve death. In fact, look at what the Bible says, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin, you know it, for the wages of sin is death. What's inter interesting to me about this is, is next to Jesus, there are these two thieves hanging on those two crosses. Both thieves were guilty. Nobody debates that. That's not even a question in the biblical account. Just like you, they're guilty. I'm guilty. Both thieves heard and saw the very same things during those terrible six hours. Both thieves were suffering severely. They were dying. Both thieves needed a savior. Now what's interesting, if you go to Matthew's account, 27, chapter 27, verse 44, interesting notation that Matthew makes about these two thieves. He says that in Matthew 27, 44, both criminals were heaping insults on Jesus. Not just one. Matthew says both were. But in the one thief, something had apparently changed. Something that happened during those six hours that they hung there on the crosses together, something changed in the heart of the one. One recognized his need and one failed to do so. Do you recognize your need? 
What's always been amazing to me is, is to find that in church when I'm talking to people, I, when, when I'm preaching, I get a look out at all your wonderful faces. And it is a privilege to be able to stand before you and preach the word of God to you. But sometimes when I kind of am able to just focus in on who I'm talking to, sometimes I see some interesting things. And I notice and I can see some people just get it. I mean, they are just in, they are just hanging on the words. They are being, they're, they're in tune with the Holy Spirit. I mean, they're in the presence of God and you can just tell in their spirits, in their minds, there's just amazing things that are happening. But sitting right next to that person is someone that's seeing and hearing the very same things. But they're as warmed over as an iced Krispy Kreme donut. Well, that's a terrible thing to say when you're getting hungry. You can tell they don't care. They don't want to be here. They're not hearing a thing. Some might be asleep. That's not new. Some are on their phones. Some are just ready to go home watching their watch, yawning. I see that. One person sees their need and gets it, and one person... Ah. Do you see your need? Some people say, well, I'm exempt from that. That doesn't apply to me. Again, look at what the Bible says. Romans 3.23 this time. For how many have sinned? For all have sinned. You see, we're all in the same boat. Every one of us, we all have sinned. And we all fall pathetically short of the glory of God. Question number one is this. Do you see your need? Question number two, also incredibly important, who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? In Luke 23, verses 40 and 41, the repentant criminal says this. He said, don't you fear God? Speaking of Jesus, he said, this man has done nothing wrong. Even the criminal on the cross realized there was something different about this Jesus. He's sinless. He's done nothing wrong. In other words, this criminal was making a statement about who Jesus was. Who do you say he is? If, if you study what scholars say, every single reputable historical scholar will say that Jesus Christ was a real historical person. He lived. It's very difficult to debate the reality of Jesus' life. He was so real and so influential that his very life splits the calendar in two. Atheists hate that. That fact drives people nuts. We have to acknowledge the fact that Jesus Christ lived. There's no getting around it. The question is, who do you say that he is? Was he just a great teacher, an incredible rabbi? There were lots of rabbis during that time. Was he just a really neat guy? Was he just super smart? Was he a fake, delusional? Was he a guy that had power from on high to raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons, to open blind eyes and make the dead come to life. Who was this man? Was he simply a man who for whatever reason splits time in two with his death or was he, or was he the sinless son of God, the innocent lamb of God who gave his life in our place for us for our sins, and on the third day, God rolls away the stone, and the world found the tomb was empty, and that he had risen from the grave. Who do you say that he is? Your belief about the identity of Jesus is incredibly important. Not your husband's opinion, not your wife's opinion, not your mom or dad's, not your grandma's or grandpa's, or your Sunday school teacher. It has to be from you. Who do you say he is? Jesus asked this question himself at different times. It was so important, he asked his own disciples. He, he asked Peter once, who do others say that I am? And Peter said, well, they say you're a lot of people. 
But then Jesus asked Peter directly, Matthew 16, 15. He said, but what about you, Peter? Who do you say that I am? And Peter responded in verse 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And even in saying those true words, they were blasphemous words. But he said who he knew Jesus was. Who do you say that he is? It's interesting when you look at scripture, it's interesting to me to to see who others say that Jesus was. Let's go through some examples. When, When God himself looked down upon the baptism of Jesus, do you remember that incredible event? That event where in a way like no other place in scripture, we see the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all engaged at the baptism of Jesus. When God looked at the baptism of Jesus, heaven opened and God spoke. And who did God say this person was? Matthew 3, 17, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Even Judas, what an incredible example, an unlikely example. Judas, you may remember, betrayed Jesus. What did Judas say about Jesus after he had done it? Matthew 27, 4, Judas said, I have betrayed innocent blood. Even the betrayer knew the identity of Jesus. When Pilate condemned Jesus to a horrible death on the cross, Pilate said, Luke 23, 4, I find no fault in him. Pilate's wife, Matthew 27, 19, warned her husband, have nothing to do with this just man. The identity of Jesus, it's so important what you believe about who Jesus was. Look at his life. Scripture tells us, Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7, that Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, humbled himself, taking on the very nature of a servant, became obedient even to death on a cross. His identity, it matters who you say he is. When Jesus was born King of Kings and Lord of Lords, was he born in a palace? No, he was born in a humble stable, not surrounded by servants, but more than likely surrounded by farm animals. When Jesus died, how did he die? Did he seat on, was he seated on a throne? No, he died while hanging on a cross. Did he wear a crown of gold? No, he bore a crown of thorns. Was he surrounded by worshipers and servants? No, he was numbered with the transgressors. He was surrounded by thieves. And when his enemies hurled insults at him and man did their worst toward him, he looked to his heavenly father and he prayed, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And when he spoke those words, I thirst, they gave him vinegar to drink, filling the last of dozens of prophecies that were perfectly fulfilled in Jesus while he hung there on the cross. And Jesus looked up to his father and said, Tetelestai, it is finished. It is accomplished. The work has been done. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he said, no one takes my life, but I lay it down of my own accord. He gave his life, and three days later, the Bible says that death, hell, and the grave were defeated. The stone was rolled away, and he is alive again. Who do you say? Who do you say he is? Question number one, do you see your need? Just like me, you're a lying, thieving idolater who needs a savior. Secondly, who do you say that Jesus is? He is the savior, the Messiah, the son of God. Question three is this, the most important question of all. Have you experienced his grace? Have you experienced his grace, the same grace that that criminal, amazingly that criminal that was hanging next to Jesus in those moments experienced. 
when he cried out, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said the most grace-filled words to a man who could do no good works, who could do nothing religious. He could not go to worship. He could not join a church. He could not pay back the debt. He could only believe that Jesus was who he said he was. And he said, remember me. As close to repentance, the words that he spoke were as close to repentance as he could come up with. Remember me. And Jesus said to that man in Luke 23, 43, I tell you the truth. Today. You will be with me in paradise. Forgiveness granted to a dying thief. Do you see your need? Who do you say that he is? Have you experienced his grace? Because the hard core truth of the matter is this, my friends, you and I were one of two thieves hanging on one of two crosses. In fact, in the Bible, you can consistently find yourself, interesting the consistency of scripture, you can consistently find yourself in one of two places. There's the narrow road and there's the wide road. In the Garden of Eden, we had two choices. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and in that we die, and there was the tree of life in which we live. One of two places. The New Testament shows us that we are one of two representative people. We are either in Adam, and the Bible says in Adam we die, or we are in Christ and we live. Jesus said one day when he returns, you will be in one of two places. You will be in the field and Jesus says, if you know him, you will be taken up. If you don't though, he says, you'll be left behind. You see, in all reality, the Bible is consistent. We are one of two thieves hanging on one of two crosses. If you remember, both thieves wanted to be saved. Did you catch that? Both thieves wanted to be saved. One said mockingly, you saved others. Why don't you come and save yourself and us? Did you hear that? He wanted to be saved. He just wasn't trusting in Christ. The other thief said, don't you fear God? This man's done nothing wrong. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so the ultimate question this morning is this, what does it take to get to heaven? Three questions. Do you see your need? Do you acknowledge that your sin has separated you from God? Second question, what do you say, who do you say Jesus is? Is he just a historical figure, a hero? Or is he the son of God? the risen Christ. Third question, have you experienced his grace? You see, many people would say to get to heaven, you have to do good works, be good enough. But if that is the case, then Jesus wouldn't have had to come and he wouldn't have had to die. We've got to experience his grace. You see, that criminal on the cross who was forgiven, he could do no good works because his hands, they were bound to the cross. He couldn't go on errands of mercy because he, he couldn't get down. The criminal who was forgiven, he couldn't even be baptized. Couldn't turn over a new leaf, couldn't join the church. All he could do was throw himself on the grace of this man dying on the cross next to him. And the good news for that dying thief is this. The grace of that dying man was enough. It was enough. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It is a gift of God so that no one can boast. 
You are never ever saved by good works, the Bible says. It is only by grace. Again, one last time. You are one of two thieves on one of two crosses. The choice is entirely up to you this morning which one you'll be. One rejected Christ. The other threw himself on the mercy of Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me. And Jesus said to those who trust him today, you'll be with me in paradise. And because Jesus sacrificed his life and three days later, he rose again. Every single person in this room this morning can experience that same forgiveness. Would you stand with me? Would you bow your heads with me? Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, speak. In that still small voice, in a rushing mighty wind, speak in this moment. As we see the Messiah hanging there on the cross, we are reminded of what has been offered to us. Father, I would ask that you minister to every person in this room today just as you're ministering to me and help us to understand God and clearly embrace your love and to realize that your love is a result of who you are, that you are love. It's not something that we can earn. We don't deserve it. It's simply who you are. And God, for us to resist it would be an insult to you. So God, by faith, even though we know we don't deserve your love, we don't deserve your grace, we don't deserve your forgiveness, we receive it. God, we ask. We ask that we'd be overcome by your love today, a love that we can't explain. The truth that we are yet sinners, that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. God, I I pray that our obedience to you would be a response to that love, to the invitation God, I pray that we would see the work of Jesus on the cross as a personal gift to us, the resurrection of your son as the perfect gift that you gave to us. And help us to experience that even in this moment. So Lord, we're asking that you would go across this room. Lord, that invitation would be granted to each and every person. I don't know where you are today. I don't need to know where you are today. God knows. And today could be the day that we make the decision. And if you'd like to make that commitment this morning, if you'd like to respond to the invitation, have you received his grace? I'm inviting you in this moment to pray this prayer with me. This will be the most important decision that you will ever make to walk with Christ, to trust in him. His identity is not a good man. His identity is the Messiah, the Savior. Come to save us from our sins. If you want to enter into that relationship with him this morning, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I believe that you you love me. And you sent Jesus to do for me what I could not do for myself. God, I believe this is important. I believe that Jesus died in my place for the forgiveness of sins. I am a sinner. I admit it. I'm a sinner and I need a savior. Jesus, forgive me. Make me brand new. Because you died for me, I'm ready to live for you. Thank you for loving me and forgiving me and saving me. Now in this moment for setting me free. I commit to know you and follow you all the days of my life and I will worship you. I will follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Can I just say this morning, if you prayed that prayer today, if you've made that decision to walk with him, if you have made that decision to come into relationship with him and allow him to be the Lord of your life, could you do something for me? This is important. Tell somebody. Tell somebody. Tell me, tell one of our staff members, tell a trusted friend or a mentor, a Sunday school teacher, a, a small group leader, tell somebody and then begin to walk in that journey in community with other people. Don't do it alone. Welcome to the family. Praise be to God. Can we give him worship this morning for all that he is, for all that he's done? A resurrected Savior. A resurrected Savior. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory and honor forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.